Good morning, everyone. Truly, truly delighted to be here. But since the word dreams is very much in the title of my talk, I'd like to begin with that. So everyone has a right to dream, right? Yes. Everyone has a right to aspire, right? But how many of us actually touch the ceiling of our dreams? How many of us even come close to achieving our dreams is something for all of us to ponder and assess. And why is that? I mean, after all, Bangladesh is an emerging market with such an economy soaring to the heights. Why are we still worried about female empowerment, the single most important agenda for the country? And that too, while we talk about empowerment, can we also think about who are we empowering? Are we just empowering the elite bubble that a couple of us belong to? Are we just talking about people who get interviewed like us? Or are we talking about the rest? Are we talking about the most underserved community who deserve to be represented, who deserve to take the main stage where I'm standing now? And what are we doing about it? You know, feminism has become a regular um, epithet of, that is de rigueur in, in almost every conversation on every red carpet. Every actor talks about it, every political leader talks about it. But come to think of it, where has Bangladesh gone in the last five decades when we talk about the absolutely underprivileged women? What have we done for them? How far have we been able to at least empower them and turn them into leaders. So in response to that, I can only come up with a, with a magic answer, and that is the ready-made garment sector of Bangladesh, which empowers more than two and a half million of female workers. But then again, are they becoming anything but supervisors? Do we see enough entrepreneurs? Do we see a lot of women in the mid-level management? Yes and no. Not yet. We are still not there. And why not? In response to all these questions that I've asked, I want to share with you a story of magic. So, the first protagonist, that's Charmin. Her name's Charmin, and she's from Shunamganj. Charmin was a garment worker. Didn't really have much to look forward to in her life. Charmin basically was always about earning bread for her family. But then, what happened? What did Charmin do which turned her into absolute protagonist in her entire area? She sat for her exams, the HSC, and then what did she do? She went to a very nearby complex and sat for admissions to a very renowned university. It's an international university that basically offered the opportunity to Charmin to sit for exams, just exams, nothing more. And you know what happened? She got selected. Now, could Charmin basically make it to the university? Yes, she did. And you know how? She had two years of preparatory guidance in which she made sure that she studied hard, and then she enrolled into the university. This is Mo, another girl from Noakhali. And you know what happened with Mo? Mo was basically so smart that when her parents got divorced, she said to herself that there's no way she was going to give in to the pressures of society. She refused to get married. And once again, she went and joined a ready-made garment factory. But then, once again, just like Charmin, she made sure that she also took advantage of admissions process, again, offered by the same university, which allowed her to basically sit for an exam. And guess what? Mo made it too. So she also got into the university, but minded 
not to the undergrad level. She only made it to the pre-undergrad level, a completely preparatory stage. And that is my hero, Tadeka. Tadeka is from Kishorgand. Tadeka literally had a father who was completely paralyzed, did not have one single person to earn the bread for the family. And guess what? She passed her HSC in 2016 and then went and sat for admissions, for the university admissions, while she was working as a quality inspector in one of the garment factories. And guess what happened again? She also was chosen to be admitted to the university, again, at the pre-UG level. What made these women aspire for education? Why did they do this? Was it the poverty push or was it an opportunity pull? What was it that made them at least dream for a better life ahead? And the outcome, if you ask me, happy to share the story. Sadeka in 2020 became the valedictorian of her class. Yeah, she did. She graduated in economics and minored in development studies. And you know, Mo and Charmin also graduated in econ and they minored in math and finance. What happened after? A wonderful story. So these women basically came to us and said, we don't want to work for anyone. We, don't, we want to really set up our own company where it will be totally female-led. So these women formed a company. And can you imagine ready-made garment workers from totally impoverished background? And just think of the courage. They made sure that they formed a company. But before they did that, I was curious. I spoke to 56 garment workers of my own factory who have no education, nothing, and I asked them, just out of curiosity, I said, would you want to become garment factory owners? And they said, no. Are you mad? I mean, we worked the whole day after that. How dare we even have that dream? And then I interviewed 37 former garment factory workers who had gone to Asian University for Women, the university that I work with, and then, you know what? All of them raised their hands when I asked them whether they wanted to do something great, whether they ever dreamt of becoming garment factory owners. All of them raised their hand. And you know what? I realized that it was the power of education that fueled the courage. It was the sheer power of simple education that steered them along. So what is it that we need to do for every woman of this country, irrespective of which background they come from? It's just one word. It's education. Education, education, and education. That gives the courage. And look at what Sadika, Mo, and Sharmin have done. So they got in touch with a woman who is an American, a Bangladeshi American. She lives in Chicago, and uh, she designs beautiful jackets made from jamdani, our traditional textile. And this designer basically was so wowed by their aspiration, she decided to place an order with them. So Sadeka, Mo, and Sharmin made jamdani jackets in Bangladesh, in one of the factories. Remember, Earlier, this American Bangladeshi woman used to make all her jackets in Chicago. She used to buy the jamnani from here, take it to Chicago, and there she used to manufacture. Now she's manufacturing it in Bangladesh. And thanks to Sadika, Mo, and Charmin. Look at the beautiful jackets. See? So it was, it was heartwarming for me to see that they could dream up to that extent that they had the audacity to dream. And you know, it cannot happen unless people like us, you and me, all together, 
basically chase the concept of collaborative, combined prosperity. What makes it work? And why, why don't things work most of the time? You know what? I always believe, and, and it's, it's a well-known fact, that there's a distinct disconnect between industry and academia. Very often, we don't even understand what the industry is practicing and what academia is preaching. So maybe we could think of a few models for the rest of the universities in Bangladesh where we could actually push people from the most underserved communities to come forward and dream. You know what? It could be a simple theory of guided preparation. It could be about reskilling. It could be about training, about policy changes and preparation. All of them could be put into a context of learning, and then maybe achievement orientation will follow. We must remember that starting from the landless farmers' daughters, down to the tea garden workers' children, down to the ready-made garment workers, who basically toil behind every sewing machine eight to 10 hours a day, everybody has a right to dream. Everybody has a right to aspiration. Everybody has a right to soar. It's just us who need to be by their side. So while we continue with our journey, let us remember how Bangladesh, as an emerging market, can make space for all these women to really rise to different heights just by being there with our nominal, minimal support. A little nudge, a little bit of opportunity that we can provide may help these women make it out there. You know, just the other day I was, um, I was reading about four female footballers, all young children. They were practicing in Kulna and they were wearing shorts. Mind you, if you've noticed the story, they were all wearing you know, black leggings also. It wasn't as if their feet were bare. But they were rebuked, beaten up, tortured. You know why? Just because they were wearing shorts. These 14-year-old children basically being rebuked for wearing shorts. So these are biases that plague our society. These are biases that stop women from crossing that Lakshman Rekha. These are the biases that make women bound to the male for seeking permission for going to the next event, for even joining a job, for even looking for opportunities beyond home. Let us stand by all these women. Let us make sure that we are all there for all of them, including ourselves. And you know, let us believe that it's not a question of hashtag he for she, it's a question and a critical discourse on hashtag she for she. A woman must stand besides a woman. A woman must make sure that we are not looking at the other through a telescopic lens and that we are looking at the other from this distance. So let's help all of them and let's help ourselves as well. Let's give a big shout out to all these women who basically lag behind because of lack of potential and because they lack the essential support that society can offer. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you.